If someone were to ask you, what are your hopes in this life? We could answer this question in many different ways. What are your hopes for this week? Your hopes, your dreams, your goals, your tasks, your plans, your projects for the rest of the summer. What are your plans? What do you hope for the rest of this year and what are your hopes for the next few years? For those who just graduated, perhaps some new hopes, a new phase of life. For those who just got married, a new phase of life. For those who have children, a new phase of life. For those who are working, those who are studying, those who have particular goals and tasks they are after. We can answer this question in many different ways, but one time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked the companions, هَلْ تَدْرُونَ Do you know مَا هَذِهِ وَمَا هَذِهِ What this is and that is? And he threw two pebbles. Two different pebbles, he threw them down and asked, do you know what this is and this is? This is an analogy. And they said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa rasuluhu a'lam. Allahu wa rasuluhu a'lam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, as for this one, هذا amal, this is your hope. As for the second one, وهذاك ajal, and that one is your departure from this world, your time, your death. In other words, no matter how old a person is, no matter what you experience of this life, no matter how many reminders we have, and no matter how pious someone may be, as ready as you may think or feel you are to leave this world, there's always going to be some hope for the rest of that day. Some dream, some goal, some objective, some to-do list that you had to finish for the week. And everyone who left before us, the majority of, of the people who left before us in this world, perhaps uh, except for those who had terminal illnesses or were on their deathbeds, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant our loved ones mercy and shifa and have mercy on those who departed before us. The majority of people do have hopes, but their hopes are down the line whereas death crosses them off. Death intercepts them. And we pray and we hope that when that interception happens, when we leave this world, regardless of what we left behind of hopes and dreams and goals and to-do lists, that we left in a, in a state, in a manner that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The grave is very interesting to study. And the concept of the soul's journey from the Islamic perspective is one that is necessary for us to reflect on. And one that oftentimes there's confusion about. Where do the souls go when we die? What happens when you leave this world, when you depart and return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And there are many famous ahadith as well that help us to frame our lives, to frame our goals and our dreams and our hopes with the purpose of life so that we don't forget. And one of the most famous narrations is the one in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, يَتْبَعُ الْمَيِّتْ ثَلَاثَةً The deceased person will be followed by three things. Three things meaning as you are leaving this world. فَيَرْجِعُ اثْنَانِ وَيَبْقَى واحد. Two things will come back and one thing will remain with you. As you leave this world, you have three things in general. You have your wealth, your family, meaning your loved ones, and you have your deeds, good and bad. And the Prophet ﷺ said, يَتْبَعُهُ أَهْلُهُ وَمَالُهُ وَعَمَلُهُ فَيَرْجِعُ أَهْلُهُ وَمَالُهُ وَيَبْقَى عَمَلُهُ The Prophet ﷺ is saying, when you die and you leave this world, you will have these three things, and your family, your loved ones, and your wealth will remain. The only thing you will take are your deeds. We know this. But at times we forget to continuously rededicate ourselves and reframe our goals and reframe our tasks and our habits to make sure that it's aligned in terms of where our investment is going, where your time is going. Having family or loved ones and spending quality time with them is an act of worship. Having wealth is not necessarily a bad thing if you're using it for ibadah and it gets you closer to Allah and you're not uh, doing something wrong with it. However, oftentimes people are so distracted by these two things that they do not invest in the third. And the third is the one that lasts. The third is the one that you take with you. And in fact, having family and having wealth could be a means of taking with you as many good deeds as possible. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us sincere and to allow us to frame our minds in a manner that is pleasing to Him. What happens when the soul leaves the body? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, this is an authentic report. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when the believer leaves this world, إِذَا حُضِرَ الْمُؤْمِنُ When the believer is leaving this world, and the rest of the hadith will continue with the disbeliever as well, the malaika of rahma come to them. The angels of mercy come to them. بِحَرِيرَةٍ بَيْضَاءٍ With a white silk cloth. فَيَقُولُونَ خُرُجِ رَاضِيَةً مَرْضِيًّا عَنْكِ إِلَىٰ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ وَرَيْحَانٍ وَرَبٍ غَيْرَ غَضْبَان they will say to this person, leave, meaning your soul, leave your body in a gentle manner, in a manner of mercy, in a manner that is easy 
And imagine as the soul is leaving the body, the very first thing that person sees is a face that is radiant and bright. It's something of comfort in a place in which we assume and we expect there is a lot of discomfort. There is a lot of fear of the unknown and the uncertain. What happens when you die? So they welcome the believing soul and they say, leave that body, radiyatan, mardiyan, pleasing to Allah and pleased as well with what's coming to the mercy of Allah and to fragrance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning the fragrance that you'll experience in this phase and to a Lord that is not angry with you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he continues and he mentions that this person will be given this fragrance and they will uh, ascend with the angels of mercy until they reach a certain place in the sky, when they reach this place in the heavens, rather, how amazing is the smell of this uh, person, this musk that is emanating from this soul, the righteous soul that came from the earth, meaning as it ascended to the heavens. And so the malaika in the heavens as well are welcoming this person. In one other report, the malaika along the way are all welcoming this person. But there's a really interesting part of this hadith that a lot of people find comfort in. And especially when it comes to losing your loved ones, especially when it comes to loss. The hadith continues, فَيَأْتُونَ بِهِ أَرْوَاحَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ The believing souls who died before them. Now they are coming to this person who just died. They're coming to the believer who just passed away. And the hadith continues, this person is welcomed by the believing souls. And they come to this person with the kind of love just to understand that you may have when your loved one in this world has been absent for a long time. So think about the one who's been traveling for months or a year or five years or some people at times are reunited after over a decade. How do you feel when you see your loved one? So the Prophet Sallallahu tells us about this really important experience of Al-Barzakh, the stage of life between this world and the next. فَيَسْأَلُونَهُ مَاذَا فَعَلَ فُلَانَ مَاذَا فَعَلَ فُلَانَ And this part of the hadith has so much commentary on it. Because now, those who died before are asking the one that is being welcomed into this world, what happened to so-and-so? What happened to so-and-so? And they are asking about different people that they knew. An example of this, perhaps a parent who passed away and their children survived and one of the children passed away after them. And now they are asking that child who died, what, what happened to the rest of your siblings? What happened to your relatives? What happened to so-and-so that we knew? A group of friends that were close, righteous for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perhaps one of them is asking, what happened to my friend? What happened to so-and-so? How is he doing? And this is one of the ways that we know of, because there's much that we don't know about. This is one of the few ways that we know of in which the news of the living reaches the dead. The news of those who are in this world reaches those who have parted before us. And it is because the one who died has taken that news with them, has taken that information and shared it with others. The so-and-so is doing well, so-and-so got married, so-and-so had children, so-and-so, and so on and so forth. And we can imagine that the people we know who passed away before us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on them. Every time they were met with a loved one who died, they would ask, how is so-and-so? They would find out some information about those who are living, find out information about you or your children or your family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on those who parted before us. And as this person is being asked, it's as though, some scholars say, it's as though so many people are asking for information. Everyone wants to know about someone in this world that was known to them, a mutual friend, that it's as though they are bombarding this person, asking for information, and then some of them will say, فَيَقُولُونَ دَعُوهُ فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ فِي غَمِّ الدُّنْيَا Leave them alone, let them rest a little. They just died and they came from a difficult place. Which place are they referring to? They're referring to this place here. They're referring to a dunya. Ghammid dunya, the hardships, the difficulties of this life. Why are they saying ghammid dunya? Because when the believer who is righteous leaves this world, they're no longer experiencing hardship. They're not experiencing pain. There are no more tests and trials and no more opportunities either. So they say to those who are bombarding the new welcome person, they are saying to them, leave them, let them be, let them relax. They just came from a very difficult place. The hadith does continue, and there's one frightening part about this narration. They ask about another person. 
as they are asking, how is so-and-so, how's my family, how's this child, how's this friend, how's this relative, how's my parent? فَإِذَا قَالَ أَمَا أَتَاكُمْ So one of the questions that this person receives is about someone who already died. So he says, didn't he already come to you? Didn't that soul already reach you way before I did? So somebody who died three years before me, didn't they already reach you? Because you are welcoming all the souls. They said this person has been taken to hellfire, al Hawiyah, one of the nicknames for the hellfire. But that soul that went to the hellfire did not go through this experience of being welcomed by the malaika of mercy, did not go through that experience of being welcomed by the righteous, the pious, whose souls have a, a fragrance from them. Rather, this person rejected the truth, rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this person did not make it to such a gathering. And the hadith does continue, and it's beyond the scope of the khutbah. The hadith continues on to the souls of the disbelievers and how they are, uh, in a way, so focused on and distracted by their torture and their punishment, they are not focused on or given any opportunity to meet other souls or to experience other things. The famous scholar Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he wrote a book called Kitab al-Ruh, the book of the souls. And he comments on the things that we do know of, and he adds some commentary as well. And it's very important to add this disclaimer. When it comes to the soul, a ruh we don't know much. It's not something tangible that you can test in a lab or understand through science or through empiricism or sense experience. You can't. And it was created that way. So there's nothing to compare it to in the physical realm. It is in a way both physical and supra-physical. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us humility. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ They ask you about the soul or the spirit. قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوْتِيتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Say indeed, say back to them, respond to them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the soul, the knowledge of it, is from the affairs of my Lord, and you have been given very little of knowledge, generally and specifically when it comes to a ruh So what happens when we die? We take the authentic narrations, we take the sayings of the companions who learn from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and sometimes there may be even connections between different statements, and of course the ayat of the Qur'an as the main source, but we cannot add more than that. There's a lot that we don't know. But we do know a couple of things. Amongst them, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, when he's asked this question, where are the souls of people who died before us? Where do they end up? He said, it depends on what kind of soul, the righteous or the wretched, those who are good or those who are bad, in other words. And this is a, a huge factor. But as for those who are righteous, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna, and nafs in the Quran could be used interchangeably with ruh, as many scholars have said. Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna. This is for the righteous soul at the end of Surah Al Fajr. Irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiya. Come back to your Lord, well pleasing and pleased as well. You are going to be pleased, and Allah is pleased with you. Enter with my servants. Come join, in other words, my servants, the righteous. Enter my guard, enter my paradise that I have prepared for you. So Ibn al-Qayyim, he says the souls could be in many places. But amongst them we know, of course, the highest of stations, Iliyin generally is a high station in the heavens, and the highest of it, A'la Iliyin, is for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the, for the prophets in general. Another place that we know from an authentic hadith in a tirmidhi is that the martyrs, the shuhada or in the form of green birds in Jannah, roaming about and experiencing the mercy of Allah until their souls are brought back to their bodies for the day of resurrection. The third, he says, is at the courtyards of the gates of Jannah. This is where most of the pious believers are. And this is something, of course, we cannot understand. And the fourth, he says, is a group, a percentage of the righteous believers are in their respective graves, but their graves are not limited to what we see in the physical realm, rather the grave for the righteous is extended out. It's made wide and spacious. And a gate, a door, a window in some form is open for the righteous to see their position in Jannah. And they will know their position in paradise, their home in Jannah better than they knew their home in this world. And then he goes on to mention where the disbelievers are amongst them, earth and sijin and other things beyond the scope of the khutbah today. The Prophet wasallam said, the believer's soul the one who is righteous, is a bird that eats from the fruits of the trees of Jannah until it's returned to its body on the day of resurrection. So the believers are experiencing something of pleasure, of joy, until the eternal pleasure itself. However, there is an important disclaimer here, which is that we don't fully understand the link between the grave and the soul itself. 
Is the soul restricted to that spacious grave or is the believer's soul able to roam about as well? But when you say salam and you enter the graveyard and you say salam to the righteous, how does it reach them? We know, for example, uh, authentic reports in Sunan Nisa'i, the Prophet وسلم, when you send salam upon him from anywhere in the world, that there are malaika angels whose sole task, their appointment is to pass on your salam to the Prophet وسلم, And we know he is fi a'la aliyin. So the way that the souls in their graves are also able to roam about and also be able to receive salam and dua and things like this, we may never fully understand, at least not in this realm, but it is something that is a reminder for us that when you enter the graveyards and you make that dua that is from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam assalamu alaykum ahl al-diyari min al-mu'minin wal-muslimin peace be upon you from the homes of those who are uh, righteous those who have passed away of the believers and the muslims wa inna insha'allahu lalahiqoon we are going to join you by the will of Allah soon as'alu Allah lana wa lakum al-afiyah we ask Allah for you and for us well-being when you make this dua and it should be a dua you make every time you visit the graveyards. And when you visit the graveyards to make this dua, it should be something you benefit from. The reflection here should be on that part where after you gave salam, you expressed your theological belief, the reality that is inevitable, that we are going to join you soon. We will be amongst you soon. And we ask Allah well-being for you and for us. When I was 14 years old, I moved for a year, one school year, and I lived with my uncle and went to an Islamic school there. And I joined a Quran program that he had started for a couple of years before he moved away uh, out of North Carolina. And the reason I'm sharing this story is that when I first got there, and I grew up here in Michigan, alhamdulillah, when I first arrived, for the very first day of the program, but just once a week on Sundays, for the very first day, I was impressed and I was amazed when he started pointing out the other students who were all younger than me, some in middle school, some in elementary school as well, and he said, this young man, this man is, had just finished Surah Al-Baqarah. This student, she finished Surah Al-Nisa. This person has finished five Ajza. She's on Juz 9 or 10. And I was amazed at this. And we started talking about memorizing the Quran, me and my uncle. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him. And we were talking about how remarkable it is for people to be in an environment in which their sole competition is to gather more of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, not just to memorize and not for any worldly benefit to memorize with understanding, to memorize with tafsir, to memorize with the intention to hold on to it, not just to become a hafil or hafil and then move on and take a title because you care about people. No, you genuinely want to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us. You want to preserve it and be preserved by it. You want to act upon it and understand it. You want to see the world through that lens, that worldview, and you want to die upon it as well. And I was so amazed at how the competition here is a competition of khayr, of goodness. And it was inspirational even for me. What's interesting about this, when we look at the trends and the many complaints and the many struggles that a lot of people go through, especially a lot of youth, high school, college, and younger as well. When people come to us and they say, I feel so disconnected from Islam. I feel like my parents did not really give me what I needed in terms of Islam. I feel like they gave me a lot of other things. Like what? There are a lot of parents, when their children say, sometimes jokingly or in a very serious manner, I don't want to go to school, the parents say there's no two options. There's no two ways about it. Yes, you are forced to go to school and we will make the decision for you. Why are there no two opinions about it? Because we know what's best for you and we are making that decision on your behalf. So it's not something that is up for debate. There's not a parent who heard from a fifth grader, I don't want to go to school anymore. I just want to stay home and play games. And the parents said, you know what? I love you so much, so I'll let you leave school. That's not a thing. You're doing what's best for your child. And at times we force our children because we know what's good for them, we force them when it comes to secular education, and they should have the highest standard of ihsan in everything they do. There's nothing wrong with that. We force them when it comes to having a high priority, when it comes to a job or marriage, that this is something you have to keep in mind. And yes, these can be great acts of worship. In a way, we force all of these worldly milestones and achievements and blessings and privileges. We force these things and we don't think twice about them. And at times, when we do all of that and we don't give anything of Islam or enough of Islamic knowledge and a spiritual atmosphere at home and heart softeners and nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, memorizing the Quran, understanding it, we gave them everything they needed by force of a dunya and we did not give them what they actually needed for the akhirah. And they end up having what some people? A struggle between their belief, their worldview, their Islam, 
and what they're actually chasing after, what the priorities are. Why? Because for the last 10, 15, 20 years, these are the things we heard that were emphasized. And these are the only things, or mostly, that we heard that were emphasized. For many people, it leads to a love, hubb dunya a love of this world that is unhealthy for the believer. For other people, it leads to a love of wealth or for uh, certain types of prestige of this world or jobs or marriages or anything else. When we show them that religious matters are secondary and that they are optional and that if you miss them, it's not a, as big of a deal and that you should never put any pressure with religious matters but absolutely put pressure with secular things, then religion becomes an optional thing. Religion becomes a weak thing. Religion becomes a secondary thing. When it is the sole purpose of life, that we know who Allah is, that we worship Allah, that we make it to paradise. And yes, all of the worldly things that were mentioned here, we want to pursue them but as acts of worship and not at the expense of that which is lasting. Not at the expense of the akhirah. Al-Hasan al-Basri rahimullah, he said, حُبُّ الدُّنْيَا رَأْسُ كُلِّ خَطِيئَةٍ The love of this world is the head of every sin. Why? Because when you love this world, it's easy to justify in the moment, to justify falling into a sin or repeating a sin. Whereas in that moment, if your love for the akhirah was greater, you would not find yourself falling into that sin. If your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was greater, you would find yourself more attached to the things that are pleasing to him. A young high school student in one of the halaqat that we had, we were talking about financial freedom, how important it is for Muslims to have passive income and investments, free up more time so you can seek knowledge, be with your family, and so on and so forth. And he said, I want my goal, I want a million dollars a year. And some of the students around him laughed. He said, no, I'm serious, I want a million dollars a year. We said, why? He said, I want to be able to buy this, I want to be able to buy that, I want any car that I want, I want the newest technology, I want to be able to travel to any country, I want a mansion. Okay, if you made a million dollars a year, he was asked, would you really be satisfied and you'd stop if you had passive income for a million dollars a year and now you would seek knowledge, now you'd spend more time in the masjid with family, ibadah, and so on and so forth? He said, honestly, I feel like if I got to that point, I would want two million, three million, five million. This is the reality of a dunya. That you're not satisfied if you don't know what you're after. That you're not satisfied if you don't know what's sufficient for you. And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, إِنَّمَا يَكْفِي أَحَدَكُمْ مَا كَانَ فِي الدُّنْيَا مِثْلُ زَادِ الرَّاكِبِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Verily it is enough for you to have in this world like the provisions of a traveler. You stop in a place for a temporary moment and you move on. And there are so many stories we've heard from community members here and around the world when they would move from home to home. Many people would rent out a storage unit. So you put a lot of things in the storage unit. You move to your house and you say, what? When I need those things, when I have time, when I finally unpack, I'll go back to the storage unit. Some people do. Others don't. They go back to the storage unit after three, four, five, six months, realizing many of the things they accumulated over the years were things they could get by without, were things that were not that important. And I know this does not apply to everyone, but the reality is it's easy for us to accumulate, to chase after, and not to be satisfied with where we're at today, to always want more and more and more, and to get bored very quickly of what we have, never content, but when it comes to the akhirah, when it comes to ibadat, we find ourselves either plateauing, we are just stopping in one place, or we are even regressing at times. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and allow us to keep moving forward. Those groups of uh, Quran students that I had mentioned, I was 14 years old, those students were younger for the most part. And many of them had continued and continued, continued, memorized the Quran. Many of them continued, they got jobs, alhamdulillah, in different fields. Anything from journalism to doctors and lawyers and engineers and IT and so on and so forth. And some are spending their full time raising their children as mothers, as family members, alhamdulillah. And subhanAllah, just last year we heard that one of these students in this program, in fact, the student who was ahead of everyone else, that she was diagnosed with late stage cancer. And that it was too late to do anything about it, but they would try. And she had a family, has uh, two children. And subhanAllah, last week, just after uh, Jumu'ah, I believe on Saturday morning, last week it was mentioned that the doctors had basically said, there's nothing left that we can do. So this was a terminal illness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of our brothers and sisters and their family members who dealt with and experienced a terminal illness. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us afiyah, well-being in this life and the next. And last week, she returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that state. She had been reviewing, teaching the Qur'an, inspiring others. And the reason I mention this today is that oftentimes when people go to these types of janazas, this was out of state, when people go to these janazas and they say, I'm moved in the moment. I feel like I want to do something different. I feel like I want to change. Many times people will leave the graveyards and they will change. Other times people will be moved in the moment and they won't change. 
and others will make lifelong changes that they benefit from and reflect on for many years. The point is, you don't need someone in your family or a loved one or any of us, God forbid, may Allah grant us well-being. You don't need someone to be going through a terminal illness and told you have three months to live for you to wake up every single day thinking that I'm going to leave this world at any moment. The reality is any one of us can leave this world at any moment. And that is the reality for all of us. And that is a reality we have to keep remembering. We forget. And the reason we forget is because this world is filled with distractions. And if you don't take control of the distractions and you don't filter out certain things and you allow these habits to continue, you will find it more and more difficult to come back to the thing that you know is true, the thing that is inevitable. And the Prophet Wasallam told us that death is the destroyer of pleasures and to think about it frequently. Think about it, the thing that destroys pleasures. Why does it destroy pleasures? Because in that moment, at that janaza, when that person passed away, when you heard about the may Allah of mercy on our brothers and sisters who left before us, what it does for you, the Prophet wasallam, he said, is that if you're going through a difficult life, it's going to help you in that moment. It's going to expand your contentment. And if you are going through something that is of prosperity, that Allah has blessed you with a lot of wealth, then you will find that this is something that constricts your hopes. It will remind you of where you are headed. It will remind you of the grave. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us consistent and forgive us and allow us to leave this world in a good state. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on our brothers and sisters who departed this world before us. Allahumma ameen. Ask Allah for forgiveness. He is the off forgiving, the ever merciful. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that when the believer enter the, enters the grave, we have only two authentic ahadith about this, this point right here. When the believer enters the grave, they are met by angels of mercy who are radiant, and I'm summarizing much of this hadith, and they are called out with the best of names, and they are told, have the good news, the glad tidings of Jannah, you're going to be happy. And then something appears to them, a man with a handsome face appears to the person in the grave in some form, and they have handsome clothes, and they have a good smell that's coming from them, and the person says, have the good news, receive the glad tidings that will bring you joy on this day. So the one who died says, who are you? Your face is a face that brings good news. Who are you? He says, I am your righteous deeds. Ana I am your righteous deeds. And he says, oh Allah, hasten the hour. Oh Allah, bring about the hour, a sa'a. Resurrect us, O oh Allah. Bring it quickly, O oh Allah. Why? So that I can go back to my family and my wealth. This person has seen now the reward of their good deeds. They've seen now where they're going to end up in Jannah. And all they are thinking about is, I cannot wait for that moment. I'm just waiting for resurrection. And they enjoy this moment in al barzakh until the Akhirah, until the day of resurrection. They are safe on the day of judgment. They are shaded by their deeds, shaded by the Quran, shaded by their charity. And as they enter Jannah, protected by the mercy of Allah, crossing over the hellfire as well, shaded all the way until they enter paradise and protected, relieved, interceded for. And by the Prophet ﷺ's intercession as well, his shafa' as well, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be encompassed by it. And they enter Jannah and they are there forever. On the day of judgment, there will be some people who will see a man in a certain form of light. And this man will be asked, who are you? As he is giving them good news and interceding for them. And the man will respond, I am your recitation of the Qur'an. I am your good deeds. I kept you up during the night and I kept you busy during the day. Some of us stay busy with many other things and there's no end to these things. Whether it's entertainment or the pursuit of endless wealth or anything else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be people of balance, people of priorities who give everything its due right. What can we do in terms of practical steps? Number one is to visit the graves often. This is something many people don't do, but the Prophet ﷺ encouraged it because it will help you detach your heart from this life. And this is something we should teach our children to do as well. And when you go to the graveyard, is to make that dua from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And when you hear that there is a janaz in the community or nearby a masajid, try to make it out every single time. It is a reminder for us and a benefit for those who passed away. And inshallah ta'ala, benefit when you are prayed upon in the future. Number two is to remember death frequently. Not so that you are paralyzed by its reality, but rather you are liberated from this world so that you are more productive, so you are taking action, so that you can do what the Sahaba did when they were reminded of death, work harder for that moment. And number three is to cut down on distractions. Remove the distractions from your life. 
whether it is a social media app that you're spending two or three hours on every day, or you're binge watching too many TV shows, or you're spending an excessive amount of time on video games or socializing or anything else, cut down on the things that you know will not benefit you when you leave this world and have your leisure, your moment of raha with your family and your loved ones and your friend as an act of worship for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in an excessive manner. And remember that when you leave this world, the only thing you will take are your deeds. So take as much good as you can. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on those who passed away before us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for all of our sins, the major and the minor, the past, present, and future. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to leave this world in a good state.